Well, I am thrilled to be here today with Mark Eaton. Mark is an NBA All-Star, uh, 11 or 12 seasons, and uh, also numerous records, uh, two records of a particular note, most block shots in one season, 456 which is amazing, and career average block shots as well. So he's, he's a team building expert. Uh, he's not here to talk about basketball per se, but about all of the things that we can learn from him in team building. He has a fantastic new book out called The Four Commitments. Uh, I read it twice. I usually don't read books twice, but it was so interesting both to read his story of what his, his life has been about, but then also the principles that are shared in uh, this book. It is an incredible journey of a, uh, of a, of a very tall auto mechanic who uh, ends up and his entire life changing and then going on to the NBA and now being a world-class speaker and author. So I'm, I'm so glad that we have an opportunity to talk today. Welcome. Thank you, Skip. It's uh, my honor to be on your show. and, and uh... Wow, what a repertoire of interviews you've had and, and people you've met. And as we were discussing, a lot of people we, we have in common. So it's great to, great to meet you. We do. And you're the first that I've done this way. All of mine have been in person. So this is, oh. this is the first time we're taking advantage of technology. People interview me this way, but I haven't done it the other way around. So <laughs> uh, we're glad to, to try it out. And I think the, um, the other NBA uh, superstar that we interviewed in person was Senator Bill Bradley. So um, mm. uh, also talking about uh, a number of different things in terms of winning. But we are, we are glad to, uh, to talk. And I wouldn't normally start here, Mark, but your um, height is, is notable. And it's not something I would talk about, but your website is seven, four, seven what is it? Seven feet? Sevenfootfour.com. Sevenfootfour.com. Your mm -hmm. uh, height is prominent in the book. And studies show over and over, the more height you have, the more money you make, the more authoritative you feel. People gravitate toward people of height. People admire height. Earning potential is higher. Career advancement is faster. The advantages, advantages in society for being tall are significant. But it doesn't seem to me that as I read your book that you quite <laughs> felt that way, uh, that the advantages were significant and that it yeah, was fabulous, I, I, right? I didn't get that memo till mu until much later in my life, I think, is, uh, is the issue. But no, it's, uh, you're correct. I was always uncomfortable with my height, and always standing out was not something that I equated with success at all. Um, and um, in fact, myself and, and a lot of tall people try to actually be smaller, especially earlier in their life, because uh, it's so uncomfortable being stared at and gawked at and pointed at in the comments. And and uh, so you have a tendency to want to try and run and hide as opposed to accept that authoritative place maybe that you uh, that you have in your life. And it it's taken me many, many years to uh, to get over that. Well, you certainly have an interesting start to your, your story and, and this, this auto mechanic uh, career and story that you have and, and how, um, how that changed with the visitor who, of course, was looking at your height. And um, I found that particularly uh, interesting because it, um, that, that who became your coach. Talk a little bit about that. Um, that persistence, who it was and what happened. I'd love to just share that part of your story because it's so integral sure. to the rest. Yes. Well, I grew up in Southern California and um, I played a few sports growing up, but uh, was never really good at any particular one. Uh, and after high school, uh, I you know, didn't really have any offers to go play basketball or anything else uh, on a collegiate level. And and thought it was probably time to just decide to go get a job. And so I went to trade school for a year. My, my father is a vocational educator, a marine diesel mechanic. And so I grew up around wrenches. I went to automotive trade school for a year and, uh, and then was working at a tire and auto center in Southern California, uh, probably there for about a year and a half. And everybody used to come in my shop and say, you know, why aren't you playing for the Lakers or why aren't you playing basketball? And it used to irritate me because I didn't run around telling everybody else what they should be doing with their lives. And, why were they so you know, persistent in telling me about mine? And one day, a gentleman stopped by who happened to be an assistant coach at uh, a junior college, which was located just a couple miles down the road from this tire store. And 
uh, he came in with the same question, of course, you know, why aren't you playing basketball? Have you ever played basketball? Like, what's your deal? Why are you working here at seven foot four as a mechanic? And, um, and I rebuffed him at first, like everyone else. I was like, just, you know, do you want your car fixed or not? And I was, I was rather short with people <laughs> back then, but, um, uh, eventually he, he kept coming back and coming back and, and he kept telling me, look, I can show you some things about basketball that you probably don't know. I've worked with big guys. I know things about being a big guy that you don't know. And I'd love the opportunity to just share them with you one day. And well, through a series of adventures, he kept coming back and bringing me shoes and college catalogs and bringing other NBA players over to meet me. Uh, I eventually said, okay, you know, I'll give you 30 minutes one day. Let's go out and see what this is about. And, um, and when we went out on the basketball court, he started showing me some, some basketball moves I could make as a big guy. Uh, it was intriguing to me because he was showing me basketball from a different perspective that I didn't even know, uh, didn't even know existed at that moment in my life. I'd never considered basketball from how he taught it and what he knew about it. And it was intriguing enough where I said, well, you know, maybe I'll give this a shot for a little while, I'll just see what it's about. And I started working out with him in the evenings when I got done with my job. And eventually after a few months, decided to go back to junior college just for one year to see what it would be like and, and but not give up my day job either uh, because I wanted that fallback that, uh, if it didn't work out, I could still go be a mechanic. And so that's, that's kind of how it started. But it was his persistence and his willingness to say, look, if you want to do this, I'll be here for you every day. I'll meet you. We'll work out together. And I think that that connection and that commitment is really what caused me to say, OK, I'll, I'll try it for a, a little while. He was persistent. I mean, he was fishing to just get you and finally, finally hooked you. I think that... Uh... I think you were just satisfying him from your book. You were saying just because he would leave you alone finally if you did it. <laughs> yeah, he was very persistent. Um, uh, and, and not like from a sales perspective, but he just so cared about other people and could see something and had knowledge that he wanted to share with me. And he was so effervescent about it and excited about it that that times at times I was like, oh, you know, just settle down a little bit. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I did just initially agree to go meet with him because I'm like, well, maybe if I go out uh, on the court with him for 30 minutes, he'll leave me alone. I can go back to work because I had worked on a straight commission job. So every time he came in the shop, I wasn't you making any money. money. <laughs> that, that frustrated me also. And, and Coach Lubin, is that his name? Yeah, Tom Lubin. Mm -hmm. So he was persistent. How, how important then is it to you uh, for people in general to find a mentor, find an encourager? Um, in career or in life? Is that a key component? I think it's critical because I think sometimes we look at life as we have to recreate the wheel. You know, we've got to figure it all out on our own. And if you study uh, motivation and success, and you mentioned, you know, even just taller people, uh, there are people that come along in your life that can teach you the right things if you're willing to listen at the right time. And at that moment in time, um, I was looking for something else. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea that it was sports, uh, but um, there was something within me that said, you know, I'll, I'll take a look at this. I'll, I'll give this a try for a little bit. And, and even though it was something that it had, I, I'd, I'd only seen failure in prior to that experience, um, there was, I, I thought, well, maybe this guy knows something that I don't know. And, and it's, it's time for me to learn what that is. Well, Mark, I saw that several times in your book. It was something that struck me about you was, uh, and, and it's not necessarily even one of the four commitments, but it's just something about you and your style, which was your willingness to seek advice. I, over and over, you, you would ask somebody, you would seek somebody out, and even if the advice may not be what you needed or what you wanted to hear, you seemed to need to hear it at that time. Uh, but it, it also struck me as part of your story, part of your success, is this consistent looking for people and, and then kind of cornering them into a, a place to say, I want this advice. And you were sincere and genuine about it, and you ended up getting that feedback, whether it was about basketball or whether it was about something else. Um, it seems to me that's a consistent theme. Is that accurate? It is. I, I've always been that way, and I'm not sure exactly why. I, I think uh, maybe I'm always looking for my center or, or that place of groundedness or where do I stand. And I think when you're so big in the public eye, not from a celebrity standpoint, but just from a, figure, a physical stature standpoint, and people are always poking at you and staring at you, you're always feeling like, well, well, where do I fit? Where do I go? Where do I stand? 
And um, it was through the advice of others that I started figuring that out. Uh, well, okay, I can stand on the basketball court. That's something I can do. And there's somebody here who can teach me things I don't know. Uh, and then going forward in, in business and, and doing my speaking career, I was able to find those people because I did seek them out. You know, we were talking about the National Speakers Association uh, before we got started. That was another place I went and I said, you know, I don't know who these people are. I don't know what they're doing, but they're making a, su a, su a success of the business of speaking. What can I learn here? And, and I went there and I found a coach who helped me develop the, this presentation and which ultimately, ultimately uh, led to this book. Uh, because of that same thing. I was willing to sit down and say, well, what do you know that I don't and how can I apply that? It, it seems to me that that uh, mindset is really rooted in humility and that to be uh, a winner and successful and also to remain humble at the same time so that you're constantly learning is what keeps you on that same track. So just an observation, but I certainly love that um, about you and your story. Early in the book, you talk about teamwork and you say teamwork is very often misunderstood. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how teamwork is misunderstood. Yes, um, I, you know, I think one advantage of being a professional athlete is uh, I had the opportunity to play team at the highest level. You know, you're, uh, you know, in, in sports, you always know where you stand on, on a daily basis, right? You just look at the scoreboard. And I think in business, sometimes people go along and they say, well, we're a team, we're a team, without really understanding the deeper nuances of it. And when your career is defined on a daily basis by how you perform, um, and if you lose two or three games in a row, you could be living in a new city the next week if you don't get it figured out. Uh, sometimes you have to close all the doors and kick, kick the coaches out and sit down and say, come on, let's talk man to man here and, and get this solved. Um, it gives you some insights into really what makes a team work and uh, that commitment is really about myself to my teammates and vice versa. But that's where the juice is, uh, that we all have our individual skill sets, which I, I talk about also, that you, you bring to the table. But when the rubber meets the road, it's our ability to get along together in the common cause of the mission of where we're going and what we're doing um, that makes the magic happen. And I don't care what type of business you're in. It's the same thing uh, in and out um, that I see over and over again, uh, that that is the, the missing link. Well, let's just talk a little bit about um, those four commitments. And I think it builds some of the, the components of teamwork that you're talking about in such a powerful way. I don't want to go through all the four commitments because uh, we don't have time and that's why people should read the book. But the first one is interesting because it's know your job. And that's not something that most people would think about when they think about teamwork and, and, and the four commitments of a winning team. But you start there, know your job. What does that mean? And where did you develop that context? Well, so, so Coach Tom Lubin had given me some basics of, of basketball and how to do things as a big guy. And I, as I began to develop sort of an overall skill set of, you know, how to shoot the ball, how to dribble the ball, et cetera, uh, it gave me a, a beginning. Um, but it wasn't until I was in college that I really started understanding what my forte was. Like, what did I bring to the table that differentiated myself from everybody else? And I had an interaction one afternoon at the men's gym at UCLA, and I really wasn't playing much at UCLA. In fact, I, I spent two years sitting on the bench there. Um, but um, one summer afternoon, I was working out at the gym, and, and Wilt Chamberlain pulled me aside. Uh, and he used to come down there and still work out with the young guys. He lived just above the campus up there in Bel Air, and, and he'd come down and work out with us at this men's gym. And he pulled me aside and he said, you know, why are you running up and down the court trying to chase all these little shorter, faster players? He said, come with me and let me show you what your job is out on the basketball court. And he took me out on the court and he put me in front of the basket. And he said, you know, you see this basket behind you? He said, your job is to stop players from getting there. Your job is to make them miss their shot. Your job is to collect the rebound and throw it up to the guard and then to let them go down the other end and score it. And your job is to kind of cruise up to half court and then see what's going on. And it was a, a light bulb experience for me from the standpoint of he took all the mystery out of basketball and distilled it down to one significant small, you know, well, a large role for me that I could play. But one, one individual characteristic of my understanding of the game of basketball and said, look, if you do this and you do it well, this is something that you can be great at. And it was like, wow, how did I miss this all those years of playing basketball? 
uh, that this is what I could do well. And um, so I call that knowing your job. What's that one thing you need to focus on? Uh, and what are the things that you need to let go of? There were, when I got to that level of playing basketball, there were things that other players did well, such as dribbling, shooting the ball better, things like that. And so it was critical for me to find out what my place was out on the basketball court. How could I help my team win? And how could I help myself individually by focusing on just one aspect of the game of basketball that I could really excel at? Uh, and so, um, so in business, I find the same things. You know, we, you're running around trying to do all these things, put all these fires out. Well, what's the reason people do business with you? What do you, what's, what do you bring to the party that you need to spend more time on that got you to where you're at right now in the first place? And let's go back to that fundamental thing. So in the book, I explain that in, in greater detail. But um, I, I, that's 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 knowing your job. That's focusing on the one thing you could be great at. I, I turned that little five-minute conversation into a 12-year NBA career. Five minutes with Wilt Chamberlain, who knew? And yeah, exactly. it, it is true even in business, uh, those same things, and you do a great job of, of explaining that in the book because uh, people oftentimes try to do everything. You know, when, you're, when you do a, a performance review, people will say, here's everything you could do, and then people think, well, let me focus on these weak areas, but those weak areas are often because you shouldn't be doing them at all and somebody else should pick no. up and that's what that's what teamwork is about and it, it, it was very interesting to me because if everyone is doing their part and their specialization and know their job then that makes a great team but it's not always thought about in the way that that you put it so clearly in this uh, in this book um, yeah and, so. and, yeah and it's also it's also about honoring your role because you can't be everything to all your customers to all your all your employees there's really one reason that you're there in the first place. And when you focus on that and get rid of that conversation about the weakness, the weaknesses and the things you don't do well, and that's where you really stand in your power. And when I stand in my power and I'm honoring my role on the team, I give you the ability to honor your role on the team. And that's where the foundation starts. It, it's terrific. I just want to talk, um, I, I want to almost do a lightning round and just throw out a few words and just see what pops in your mind of, of things that, that you'd like to share because there's so much in this book. It's not, that's why I had to read it twice. It's not really just the four commitments. I had an outline going, but there's all this other advice kind of weaved in. So just throw out a few words that you can just share something that pops into your head. Uh, uh, failure. Failure is a part of the process. Uh, there were many times I made the wrong decision, like going to UCLA, for instance. I, I thought that was going to be the ticket. I played well in junior college and um, thought UCLA is the name of the game. If you're in Southern California, that was the, the biggest name in college basketball. And I ended up sitting on the bench there for two years. Uh, and uh, I thought my career was over because of that. And at the same time, it gave me an opportunity to kind of find my own team in the NBA, or at least make some cold calls and find somebody who would give me a tryout. And I ended up coming to the Utah Jazz when they were a bad team in a bad market. And they could afford to give me the time to improve my skill set and were willing to work with me over a longer period of time. It ended up working out well for both of us. But, but initially, once I got to UCLA and I had these dreams of being on national television and everything, and it didn't, didn't pan out. To me, that was abject failure. I thought I just I'd totally blown it. I thought my my you know I'd made the wrong choice, wrong school, wrong decision, um, and yet long term it, it was a blessing in disguise. And you used it because you even took those uh, practices and made it made it your thing. How about this? Great coaching. Great coaching. Uh, you know, the, in in the world of basketball coaches, there's a little bit of everything, just like there are bosses. And I think that the great coaches are the ones who understood what my skills were and were able to position me in uh, to to win. Uh, they taught me the things I needed to know. They were tough on me when I when I needed that, um, but they always could kind of keep the long term in focus and understand not only myself and my role, but the other players and how putting them all together in the right combination and, and creating the play or the, the, the vision of where we were going and holding to that vision, I think um, is what paid the greatest dividends. And I look back at the fundamental things I learned from a lot of the great coaches that I still hold as truths today, even in the business world that have served me uh, for 30 or 40 years that I learned from these great coaches because they were because the fundamentals were of critical importance to them. What makes a winning team? 
What makes a winning team is, uh, I'm gonna go back to that commitment to the people around you. you. You certainly have to have great players, you have to have the skill uh, and, the, and the right people in the right positions. But even doing that doesn't guarantee that you're going to win. It's that, that extra juice of um, really playing off of each other and understanding each other out there on the court and a, and a deeper rapport that only comes from spending time together. The more time you spend on the court, the more time you spend executing the play, and having those little failures along the way or the plays that don't go well uh, gives you that deeper understanding and those nuances of where are my teammates on the court to where you get to a, a place of sort of being in that zone where you don't even have to think about where your team in it, teammate is at any given time. You can feel them. You can see them through the back of your head. Uh, and that that beauty of uh, chemistry that occurs out there on the, on the court is, um, is really where the, the wins come from. Well, Mark, this has been great. I just throw out these things and you're so quick uh, with it. So you know that you have been on quite a media tour. You are well experienced in this because they, they literally flow right out of, out of uh, experience. Um, th th this book, as I said, The Four Commitments, it is, it is great. It is your story. People will love it even if they're not basketball fans, if they're not sports fans, because there's just so much packed into it in terms of success principles and teamwork and leadership. I just want to ask you about your transition from the court to a completely new world of, uh, of author and speaker. And how are you enjoying it? I mean, that's a, that's a whole new thing, right? From going from auto mechanic, where you had to learn that, to a completely different world of basketball. And uh, people think, oh, naturally, you just go off and speak, et cetera. Not so natural, right? How has that been for you? Well, it's, it's been challenging and rewarding. Uh, and it's not so natural because, as we were talking about, Growing up being tall, was, is, uh, it's always been uncomfortable for me to a certain extent. And so putting myself out there to say, all right, not only am I going to play in the, in the NBA, but now I'm going to walk on a stage and inspire 400 people that are sitting there that are like, who are you and what could you possibly know about my life, uh, is a whole new challenge. Uh, and in the world of playing bigger and getting out there and, and, um, and doing things in a bigger way, it was the next step. Uh, and and it has been a transition. I had to, it was like starting all over again because you you go you go back to being a rookie of I don't know anything. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I I have a story. I don't know how to tell it well. And so I had to find the right people to help me. Um, but it's been incredibly rewarding because once I found that spot and I found that 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 good juice um, and people responded to it, uh, like you mentioned in the book that 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 you know, it's, it helps people. And I guess that's what I'm all about is that is that I've had great coaches and mentors who've come along in my life to show me what I needed to do next. And it is my hope that through this book and through my speaking that I'm able to show other people um, those same things and give them the gifts that have been given to me as a way of kind of passing the message along of like, here's some things to be successful that I've learned and I hope that they'll help you as well. Uh, and, and having that one person that comes up afterwards and saying, you know, thank you, I really needed to hear that today. That's what makes it all worthwhile for me. And, um, and I continue to try and get better and learn more. And, you know, being an author has been a, a whole nother conversation of, uh, uh, yeah, with like we're doing what and how does this work? And, but you just kind of plod through it and, and eventually you, you figure it out and, and hopefully you, you turn out a great product that uh, is beneficial to other people. In, in, in my book, I talk about mediocrity and mediocrity I say is the result of too much comfort. And you, you consistently <laughs> in your book um, talk in your life. Uh, look for opportunities where you put yourself out and make yourself uncomfortable, whether you're asking for advice, whether you're jumping into a new field, whether you're now embarking on a speaking and writing career, uh, et cetera. And I think that is a, is a big indicator of people I've seen over and over who are successful and uh, you, you definitely do that over and over. So uh, we all start out in some way insecure uh, about something somewhere. And that story from those initial insecurities uh, about height or whatever, all the way into the success you are. I love that you share the journey because oftentimes people only see the success and the awards. They don't see the struggles, the fights, the uh, I'm not sure about this. I think I failed at the here, et cetera. They, they don't just see the trophy and the ring. They see this whole uh, journey. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I encourage everyone to get this book, The Four Commitments. It really is a, a terrific story. It's your story. 
and thank you for sharing it with us today. I appreciate it so much, Mark. Well, thank, thank you, Skip. It's been my honor to be on your show as well, and, and uh, best wishes to you. Thank you. Have a good one. We'll see you in person at some point. Yes, indeed. Look forward to that. Take care.